Beloved Church of God, beginning our service before the Lord, let us stand and affirm the promise that relates to the door of our hope. Let the resurrection of Christ reign in our bodies. Amen. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are grateful to your holy name for this once again privilege to be in this place that your hand has outlined for the worship of your holy name. And so allow your inheritance in the name of the blood of the covenant to be lifted to heights higher than us and to break all burden and sin that binds us. May in this place be cursed as before all the works of devil, illnesses, poverty, premature death, demonic dependencies, all forms of fears, depression, destruction, covetousness, stagnancy, ignorance. All of this, let it depart from the tents of your holy people and stand, O Lord, on the place of your rest, you and the ark of your greatness, and may your saints be clothed in your salvation, and may they rejoice before your countenance. Give us more from your Spirit, fill us with your Holy Spirit, and allow us to find your holy countenance. We thank you that this service is presented by Apostle Arkady in your divine arms, and we ask you to continue to lead it with your high and uplifted hand. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. May you be blessed. Please be seated. The book of Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted, by its deceitful lusts, to be made new by the spirit of your mind, and to put on the new self, created by God in true righteousness and holiness. The theme is the right to the power to put off our former way of life so that we can clothe our bodies into a new way of life. And the words, the right to the power, that means a specific form of anointing that we need to receive so that we can have this right. Power is always anointing, and the anointing can be used by priests and prophets and kings, of course. And for this anointing, it is necessary to have the anointing of a teacher who has these commandments and the anointing of a student who is able to receive these commandments. To fulfill this decreeing commandment written in the book of Apostle Paul and presented to us in the series of sermons of Apostle Arkady, we need to put three destiny impacting, commanding, and fundamental acts into practice. These are put off, be renewed, and put on. Fulfilling these three requirements will determine whether our salvation happens that is given to us in the format of a seed, which we need to obtain as a possession in the format of the fruit of righteousness. Our salvation that is given to us in the format of a seed will not be able to become fruit or our possession without the ability to put off something, to renew something, and to put something on, to be to put on Christ and put off our former way of life. Relevant to this, we stop to study the allegory contained in the 18th Psalm of David, in which getting to know and confessing the power that is contained in the heart of David, consisting of the eight names of God, allowed God to love and call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and gave God the legitimate basis to use the power contained in the capabilities of his names in battle against the enemies of David. And this is written in Psalm 18, 1 through 4. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I have been saved from my enemies. Let us together now proclaim that our inheritance that is in Jesus Christ. Lord, you are my strength. Lord, you are my rock. Lord, you are my fortress. Lord, you are my deliverer. Lord, you are my rock in whom I take refuge. Lord, you are my shield. Lord, you are the horn of my salvation. And Lord, you are my stronghold. In a specific format, we already looked at our, at our looked at our inherited lot and the qualities and promises contained in the strength of God Most High. Lord, you are my strength. And here, we see that the Lord has magnified His word above all of His name. First of all, in the temple of our body, and then within the church of Christ. And this opened to us and made known to us this name of God's strength. You are my strength. 
uh, and his strength is that he put has put his uh, qualities in his, all of his qualities characteristics in his name and now his word or in his word and this word now is above all his names now let's continue to study our lot and the power contained in the name of God rock which in its inner essence has an unearthly quality which is inherent to the nature of our Heavenly Father and is beyond the comprehension of the typical human mind of man. In Scripture, the identification of the word rock regarding the natural qualities of God Most High is illustrated with the following colorful tints. Rock is resistant, strong, healthy, wise-tested, rooted, well-established, immovable, continuous, non-diminishing, constant, fearless, non-penetrating, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And here is the qualities that God has, and if we correctly collaborate with the truth of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, He will allow us to also have these qualities. And here is how the quality of the word rock, when it comes to the name of God Most High, identifies itself in Scripture. Rock is stone, cliff, heaviness, weights, weight, and scales. Therefore, the power of the name of God, Rock, contains the ability of the Most High to judge or weigh upon the scale plates of His justice all that is created by Him to punish or reward each one according to their weight. Therefore, to possess the power of the Most High contained in the Rock of His name is to possess the authority and right to judge both yourself as well as those people who are under our responsibility to judge within the parameters of the commandments and statutes of the Lord or to weigh your words and your actions upon the scale plates of justice of the Most High as well as the words and actions of people that are under our responsibility. And to master and clothe ourselves into the unearthly quality of a rock contained in the name of God Most High which quenches our hunger and thirst and brings us to power over our calling It is necessary for us to study four classical questions. First, what in essence is his name Rock? What purpose is our in our prayers as the quality of the name of God Rock called to fulfill? What price do we need to pay to be clothed into the quality of his name Rock? And by what results do we need to judge that we truly possess the virtue of his name Rock? In a specific format, we already studied the first two questions and are studying the third, which is the price, the price we need to pay to possess the right to clothe our spirit into the virtue of the rock of the Lord so that God can receive the legitimate grounds that he needs to keep us in his perfect peace. Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. And so this perfect peace, it has a specific price. And to put, put us or place us and himself into this perfect peace, we need to have this appropriate price, and this appropriate price is necessary so we have this quality of God's rock. We have already studied uh, a couple of prices, and today we will study the price of the fifth condition for the right to possess the quality of the rock of the Lord, and this is to integrate or implement the order of God into your calling or subjugate your calling to to the order of God by the means of the judgments of righteousness. The price is order, God's order. And so you ask the question, what is the price? You say, Lord, you are my rock. How much does it cost to collaborate with the Lord's name rock to put him so that he could put us into his perfect peace, joy, and righteousness? And the word is order, the order of the Lord. And why the order of the Lord? Let us read. The uh, father-in-law, of Moses, Jethro, Uh, he explains to him how he will be able to endure, Moses will be able to endure with uh, bringing on people or uh, men that would be able to help him judge. Exodus 18, 21 through 23, moreover, you shall select from all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens, and let the let them judge the people at all times, then it will be that every great matter they will bring to you, but every small matter they themselves will judge. So it shall be easier for you, for they will bear the burden with you. And if you do this, and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure, and all this people will also be able to go to their place in peace. Today we, w- we won't independently be studying uh, 
the church leadership or the commanding structure within the church itself, but rather the individual person in the church whose calling it is to rule over himself or herself within the boundaries of the commandments and statutes which identify the order in which the body of Christ functions and only after look at the commanding structure so we know within what boundaries we need to obey ourselves to their words. Without the Lord's order that exists in us, we will not be able to properly or correctly obey ourselves to God's word. And how do you obey yourself? Uh, This is the order that you need to put within yourself. And when you have this order, you will not then have the question, what is the fivefold service? When the order of God is placed into us, the scriptures say, we will consider then count one uh, each other uh, greater than ourselves and not just decide, well, before this one, I will consider this one greater than myself and this one not. That won't be the case. Pastor says we need to put the order of God into our hearts so we receive the ability to count or consider each other greater than ourselves. And for this, we will turn to the initial phrase of the being studied by us text. Jethro says, Moreover, you, moreover, you shall select from all the people able men. Those that are able means valiant, courageous men. Able men are courageous men. People that are able, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them. We need to yield four characteristics from the given verse, characteristics that our spirit needs to have so that it can be clothed into the quality of a rock of the Most High, giving us the right to the power to govern over ourselves as well as those people whom we carry responsibility for before God. These are to be an able person, to have the fear of the Lord, to be a person of truth or a fair person, and to hate covetousness. We need to know that to rule or to govern is not to control or to violate the sovereign boundaries of those people we carry responsibility for before God, but instead take their guilt upon ourselves before God and be an example to them of how a person needs to obey God. And to be an example is with deed and word. Pastor is an example for us. And how many times have we heard? He is an apostle, and he is not just an example, but he needs to, according to Scripture, he needs to be an example uh, as according to Scripture. Because you may say, well, what's written in Scripture specifically for him, and I, 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 you know, is different for me. But that's not the case. 1 Peter 5, 2-4 Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as an overseer, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. And so we've already studied the first two characteristics, and that is to be strong and bold and The second is the fear of the Lord, and we will finish the third characteristic, and that is to be a person of truth or a fair person, and we'll then turn to uh, hating covetousness. And so the third characteristic, giving us the right to the power to clothe our spirit into the rock of the Most High so that we can rule over ourselves, is to be a person of truth or a fair person. To be a person of truth or a fair person is to stand guard of the codex of righteousness, according to which we need to think, speak, and behave. Here's one of the many places of scripture which contains some of the components which make up the Codex of Righteousness. 1 Thessalonians 5, 15 through 24. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourself and for all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, Test all things, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. In the given place of scripture, we see presented the role of God and the role of man, giving us the right to the power to clothe our spirit into the quality of the rock of the Most High, so that we can rule over ourselves. If we accomplish or complete our part of the job, then 
then God will receive the legitimate grounds that he needs to accomplish the promise to us by him part of the job so that he can sanctify us fully so that our spirit, soul, and body could be kept without blemish at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our role in sanctification called to preserve our dedication where we would be able to continuously bring God the offering of praise presented in the given place of scripture in ten components of the order of the law of righteousness standing guard of the holiness of truth. And these are, see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone. Always pursue what is good both for yourself and for all. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things that are beneficial to God. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Each of the ten presented components exist in one the other, come one from the other, reinforce one the other, complete one the other, and identify the truthfulness of one the other. Therefore, the truthfulness of each of the components is examined by the existence or presence of the other components in them, which in their essence or their unification demonstrate an incredible balance of the one who is perfect in knowledge. And we already have studied nine uh, conditions of the Codex of Righteousness, that exists within our heart and this codex of righteousness is within the church this is the given law in the church as well as the codex or constitution of course of the country which tell us what we can do and what we can't do how we should behave or not and so wherever people are there is a required constitution codex uh, a law by which we need to live and behave and so we are studying the Codex of Righteousness, and we will be studying the 10th condition of the Codex of Righteousness today that will allow us to uh, reach our calling, the resurrection of Christ within our body. 10th condition, to be a person of truth, standing guard of your dedication to God by the truth of sanctification so that you can rule over yourself, is to abstain from every form of evil. To abstain from every form of evil, we in this way stand guard of our dedication by the truth of sanctification, separating what is clean from what is unclean and what is holy from what is unholy, which allows God to clothe our spirit into the rock of his name so that we can partake in the unsearchable inheritance of Christ and we can enjoy the multitude of his peace. To abstain from every form of evil, it is necessary to possess the ability to be nourished with curds and honey. Curds and honey he shall eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Isaiah 7, 15. Jesus was nourished by curds and honey, so he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. If Jesus Christ needed to do this, then for us to have the Codex of Righteousness in our heart and to abstain from every form of evil, then we need to be nourished by curds and honey. And how do we do this? On the internet? No. Our saints today uh, saying it beautifully. What do we choose? Do we choose honey or do we choose poison? And so this uh, this curds, it is only within the mother, within the Church of Christ. And to be able to refuse the evil and choose the good, it is necessary to possess, uh, it is necessary to possess, to have a clear understanding in your spirit about what, according to God, is evil and what is good. Good is firstly a genetic program of eternal life embodied in the word which comes out of the mouth of God and the carriers of which is our new person. At the same time, evil is firstly a genetic program of eternal death embodied in the word which comes out of the mouth of devil and the carriers of which is our <clears throat> old person. However, the exercising force and power of these programs consists in the fact that they can only be confirmed or ratified by the mouth of man who themselves decide who their mouth will represent and demonstrate is it representative of the mouth of God or a representative of the mouth of the devil? <clears throat> and so we, confessing with our mouth, we represent either the mouth of God or the mouth of the devil. And so who's speaking, the new person or the old person? <clears throat> 
And so when we spe say or state specific things, if it is the old man, then immediately the genetic uh, sinful life activates and, and, and begin to work within the life of this person. But if we proclaim, confess the word of God that's in our spirit, then it uh, cancels out this genetic curses and connects us to heavenly blessings that then come into our life. And so what words do we speak? Who is the wellspring of these words? Is it the Holy Spirit or the devil? <clears throat> For considering that the covenant that we make with God or with the devil who poses as God is identified in the symbolic number eight, we will bring forth eight definitions of good as well as evil, although there may, there may be many more of them. And so what is good and evil? <clears throat> what is bad and what is good? We are in church and the Lord offers to us his curds and honey. What is good? Good is firstly the goodness of God. It is everything that comes from God and is God. Good is all that is truth, making us free from sin. Good is all that is primary, which is above the secondary. Good is all that uses the power of God to sow into the spirit. Good is all that does not make itself equal to God. And it is all that does not exalt itself above God. This is a renewed mind. Good is all that knows to do good and does it. This is what good is. At the same time, evil. What is evil? Of course, it will be the absolute opposite of good. Evil is firstly a clever counterfeit of God's goodness. Evil is all that does not come from God but poses as God. These are false pro apostles, teachers, false brothers. Evil is all that disguises as the truth when it is not the truth. <clears throat> this is a foreign gospel that comes from false messengers. Evil is all that replaces the primary with the secondary. When in the church they say that we need to pursue healing and anointing, ignoring the blesser and the anointer and the healer, the Lord, Evil is all that uses the power of God to sow into the flesh. I live a holy life, but your godliness, you're using it for your own personal gain. <clears throat> we live the holy life because it is God's command, not for our personal gain. Evil is all that makes itself equal to God. Evil is all that exalts itself above God, and evil is all that knows to do good but does not do it. <clears throat> and so again, knowing to do good but does not do it. This is evil. Looking at the above mentioned definitions, we conclude that to abstain from every form of evil, it is necessary to understand your sins within your thoughts, your words, and your acts, which include mistakes and unintentional sins. Here's where abstaining from every form of evil begins. We need to uh, not look at sins, but uh, improper thoughts, improper words, improper actions. I didn't want to do it, but these sins uh, uh, make themselves known in us or uh, come about in us uh, things that we don't want but uh, and so it begins with a thought and then these bad actions or words then are are coming out of us and we see them Psalm 19 12 through 13 who can understand his errors cleanse me from secret faults keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins let them not have dominion over me, then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. God will keep his servants back from their sins and will cleanse them from presumptuous or intentional sins upon the condition that his children will abstain from every form of evil. And the word abstain includes the following definitions abstain is to put forth effort in your battle against every form of evil 
Abstain is to grow strong against every form of evil. It is to demonstrate resilience and might in battle against every form of evil. Abstain is to overpower and overcome every form of evil with every form of good. Abstain is to not bend or cave for any form of evil, not yield submission to any form of evil, not even an inch. Do not let, do not be led by any form of evil, and do not negotiate with any form of evil. And let's now look at specific places of scripture that will help us understand each of these that we just listed. How do we abstain from every form of evil? We have understood what good and what evil are. We understand what it means to abstain and now to understand how to abstain from every form of evil. <clears throat> First, to abstain from every form of evil is to put forth effort in your battle against every form of evil and to not be led by personal desires and evil thoughts coming from the flesh. Matthew 11:12, And from the days of John the Baptist until now the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. And so taking uh, suffering violence and so this is referring this is not just to take something in his dedication, but this is one putting forth effort in his sanctification where he withholds himself from every form of evil. And if we don't have the ability to withhold ourselves from any form of evil, we will not be able to take any good from God that is upon our account in Jesus Christ. Second, to abstain from every form of evil is to grow strong against every form of evil. Second Samuel 3.1 now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. But David grew stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. Here we see two houses, the mind of Christ and our personal carnal mind. And so one becomes weaker, the carnal mind, the other, the other house, the house of David, becomes stronger. This is the mind of Christ. And what we uh, feed, what we give prerogative to, the house of David, the mind of Christ, or our carnal mind, the house of Saul. According to scripture, the house of Saul is supposed to become weaker and weaker within our life. Third, to abstain from every form of evil is to demonstrate resilience and might in battle against every form of evil. Psalm 89, 19 through 25 or through 24, 19 through 24. Then you spoke in a vision to your Holy One and said, I have given help to one who is mighty. I have given help not to the coward, but to the one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found my servant David. With my holy oil, I have anointed him with whom my hand shall be established, also my arm shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him, nor the son of wickedness affect, afflict him. I will beat down his foes before his face and plague those who hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and in my name his horn shall be exalted. The Lord here helps the mighty, and a mighty person is a person in this case is a person who has the truth with him and the Lord's mercy with him. With such a person, uh, the Lord uh, works. This is not just someone who is uh, confident, who is ready to go out to fight any time. No. Uh, this is a person, who, a mighty person, a person who has the Lord's truth and the Lord's mercy and who does everything correctly according to Scripture. Mighty is sometimes even closing your mouth and not uh, having a conflict with someone or, or trying to negotiate or debate something with someone, not prove something to someone else. As our pas pastor says, we don't need to prove the truth, we need to show it instead. And that's where might uh, shows itself. This is a, a spiritual growth, this is a perfect man. Fourth, to abstain from every form of evil is to overpower and to overcome every form of evil with every form of good. Romans 12, 19 through 21. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather, do not avenge yourselves, it says, beloved, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. 
Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Here it's talking about the fact that the Lord is the one who will avenge us and we need to allow him to do this, give place to the wrath of God. And this happens when we don't avenge ourselves. If a person approaches you and offends you, in ignorance maybe they say something to you in the church, do not try, do not become offended uh, serve them with good instead. This is, we're talking about a child of God, a member of church, Not we're not talking about a wicked person. You don't need to avenge yourself somehow. If a person offends me, I don't, but if a person in my presence begins to speak uh, evil things against the holy nation or, or the pastor, this is where I will not be silent and I'll say, may the Lord forbid me, forbid you, don't speak any evil against the members or the pastor. If it's against you personally, overcome this, overcome evil with good. But when they begin to speaking evil against the church or and the truth or the anointed of God, then this it's a crime to keep silent. Here's here you need to say, May the Lord forbid you, and when you come here or you come into my house, never speak negative things uh, about those things that are precious to me. Fifth, to abstain from every form of evil is to not be discouraged or bend for any form of evil. Numbers 21, 4 through 9. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way, and the people spoke against God and against Moses, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. And so the Lord did not... He did not uh, eliminate the serpents. Uh, and so... You can only be delivered from the serpents by the cross of the Lord Jesus. This is a uh, cowardice uh, within people. And so, and so, as you know, you put the serpent, uh, he put it on a pole, and when they looked at it, they uh, weren't dying. And so, this is the only way. There are some qualities we cannot just drive out. There are qualities we need to die for in the death of the Lord Jesus. When we look at his death and we are transformed and we are conformed to him with him in his death. And so cowardice is not something you could literally drive out of you. This, these are things you need to die for within yourself. Sixth, to abstain from every form of evil is to not yield submission to any form of evil, not even an inch. Galatians 2, 4 and 5. And this occurred because a false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might, be, might continue with you. This person had no cowardice in him. He talked about how these false brethren that came Uh, in and these are people that re they were hearing the truth but they 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 were still uh, demanding that the works of the law continue to uh, happen uh, that you need to still circumcise that you still need to do this and that and Apostle Paul he 
did not have. Uh, he was very confident in, sh in uh, exposing them and uh, seeing who they are. Our pastor has this, and we need to see the same thing in ourselves, that we not give way and we do not yield submission to any form of evil. Seventh, to abstain from every form of evil is to not be led by any form of evil. Proverbs 1, 10 through 16. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path. For their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. And so who is it referring to? Who The father speaks to the son and says, do not give way, do not walk in the way of the evil. If the sinner will try to entice us upon our way, how can they entice us? Evil company corrupt good habits, it says. So any friendship with people, we're not just talking about people of the world. This is not referring to them. They can't ever be our close friends, people in the world. These are just partners in business or, or uh, colleagues in business, but with them you can communicate and, and uh, you know, do trade or any kind of things like that, but only with a true neighbor. As people that can put balm upon our wounds or people we can serve, these are the neighbors that we need to be uh, friends with but corrupt company, evil company, these are people that will corrupt our good habits. And eighth, to abstain from every form of evil is to not negotiate with any form of evil, avoid and not communicate with evil company who are carriers of evil. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, 34. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupt good habits. Awake to righteousness and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. And another place of scripture, 1 Thessalonians 2, 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. A very interesting name uh, that is given to the church now who restrains a church or every individual person who will not allow the Antichrist to show himself and the one who these people, this church restrains him from being from revealing himself, exposing himself. And the way to do this is abstaining from every form of evil. When we have this ability to abstain from every form of evil, then this means that we have this codex of righteousness in our heart. And when we have this codex of righteousness, then the Antichrist is afraid of these people. False apostles and false teachers are afraid of people who have this codex of righteousness in their heart. And they are restrained them from exposing themselves. And so this was the third condition of the codex of righteousness. We finished this and now we will turn to the fourth condition, which when fulfilled will allow our spirit to be clothed into the rock of the Most High so that we can rule over ourselves. And th this is to hate covetousness the father-in-law of Moses said spoke about selecting men choosing men uh, that hate covetousness a person needs to be first bold and confident he needs to have the fear of the Lord he needs to be a a truthful person and also he needs to hate covetousness <clears throat> and this is a very, very important truth that needs to we need to know. In the time of the Old Testament, as well as the dawn of the New Testament, the prophets and apostles being inspired by the Holy Spirit consistently urged the children of God to uproot covetousness within themselves, inherited from the sinful life of their fathers, and never use fellowship with one another for shameful and dishonest gain. 1 Peter 5, 2 through 4. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, 
you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. What is covetousness? If we need to hate covetousness, we need to identify it. Covetousness is love for money or dependence upon money. And so, dependence upon money, which is the root of all evil. When the Holy Spirit, using the lips of Apostle Peter, called covetousness dishonest, he stated the essence of the quality of covetousness, which is the reason, <clears throat> the reason for all of the misfortunes of man. In Hebrew, the word dishonest in the situation. <clears throat> and so this is rude, harmful, disgusting, unfortunate, perverse, unrighteous, worthless, damaged, shameful, sinful, deceitful, immoral, unhappy, unstable suspicious, easily offended, or resentful, corrupt, angry, disastrous, malevolent, and bad. Practically, the characteristics of dishonest gain describes a person who actively partakes in evil acts and is successful in doing evil. Titus 1.10.11 For there are many insubordinate, both idle t- idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. And so there's a dishonest gain in the form of vileness and dishonest gain in this case, in this place of scripture, <clears throat> and so dishonest in the New King James and New, New International Version and filthy in the King James Version <clears throat> is disgrace, shame, dishonest, infamy, abomination, embarrassment, shamefulness, nakedness, a loss of innocence. 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 11. Now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing... With these we shall be content, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And so you say, what is a love for money? This is this vile uh, covetousness. It is a shameful quality for a Christian to have. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. When in scripture it talks about the first world being flooded with water because their thoughts were evil continually in God's sight, then this means that these evil thoughts were the result of their dishonest gain. Let's see what the book of Jude says, 1, 14 through 16. He says, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment on all to convict all who are ungodly among them for all their ungodly deeds which they have committed to an, an, un, un, in an ungodly way. And of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him, these are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. And so, again, these are the qualities that people have had that were destroyed by the waters of the flood. And we see today, church. The world is is filled with, with such people, and not just the world, churches also. What does this say? God is a creative individual, and if he condemned the world with, uh, with his floods, the next time it will be condemned with fire. And it will begin to show itself, and it will begin in the churches. And it will be uh, making itself known in an unseen way or in an unexpected way. He first needs to bundle the weeds 
People don't know even that what's happening in churches today. Churches are divided, new ones form. And so today, there's a degradation of Christianity today. And there's a lot of division because in churches there are many antichrists, unclean people, people who have become arrogant, and they divide the churches. And that means that the, the people of the last times, true evangelist, evangelism is not taking place. And so there's a complete bankruptcy of, of, of spirituality. To confirm the legitimacy of his delegation to preach the gospel of Christ, Apostle Paul said that fulfilling his calling, he never had a cloak, a cloak for covetousness. An absence of covetousness is one of the unchanging requirements of allowing people to serve. A person who loves money is not one who should be allowed to serve any form of service. <clears throat> <clears throat> not cell group leaders, not, not Episcopals, not any other roles. If his heart is a clinging to money, he should not be part partaking or participating in any form of service. First Thessalonians 2, 3 through 6. For our extortion, exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness, nor did he, we seek glory from men, either from you or from others. First Thessalonians 2, 3-6 through And so when he's talking about flattering words, using these flattering words, to benefit his covetousness or the covetousness of a person. And so how do you determine if a person is hard clings to money? It's often, a per it could even be a person that is always wearing uh, very old or, or items that he, oh no, he can't buy anything new for himself. It's also a form of, of greediness and covetousness. It's a conspired uh, greed that's in him. It's, it's something that he has a lot of money on his account and his old suit. Uh, and so the old suits that he wears is just a, a, a sign that he is trying to collect as much as he can. So in the Day of Judgment, uh, Things will not go well for him, unfortunately. And often these flattering words are words that are spoken to please others or to impress others. <clears throat> and the Lord judges very differently. In his time, God lamented and revealed by his prophets the dishonest or vile inclinations of leaders of the nation of Israel who instead of defending the interests of their nation all without exception use their position in the interests of their own personal greed or their own personal covetousness. Isaiah 56, 10, 11. His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs who cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Yes, they are greedy dogs which never have enough. And they are shepherds who cannot understand. They all look to their own way, every one of his own gain from his own territory. Not uprooting covetousness is a road or route leading to eternal perdition. Deception, hypocrisy, and double standards within the character of the servants of the church is a result of greed or, covet or covetousness which they pursue. Also, when talking about covetousness, this is also including, this includes pursuing your own personal fame or popularity as well. And so this means they need to play the role of humble people so that they can uh, gain more popularity and fame so that they have, so that others uh, praise them. Isaiah 33, 14 through 16. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites 
Who among us shall dwell in the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, he d- who despises the gain of oppressions, who gestures with his hands, refusing bribes, who stops his ears from hearing a bloodshed and shuts his eyes from seeing evil, he will dwell on high. His place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given him. His water will be sure. When emissaries of mammon, cloaked in garments of, in quote, servants of the Lord, who actively pull out individual places of scripture and give them different meaning, convincing people that materialistic success means an independence from the spirit of poverty and is a level of their spiritual maturity, they pursue the interests of this vile and shameful covetousness within their relationships with God and with one another. Emissaries of mammon who preach false prosperity and you can see this very clearly in them this covetousness in their heart to escape and not pursue this dishonest and shameful covetousness in your relationship with god and with one another it is necessary to incline your heart to the testimonies of the lord by being instructed in faith psalm 119 36 And so what is the medicine to be rid of this covetousness? Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to covetousness. It is necessary to incline your heart to the Lord's testimonies and not to covetousness. This means uh, this is how you will be able to be free or be independent from covetousness. In the given call, inclining our heart to the testimonies of the Lord is contrary to us inclining our heart to covetousness. Specifically, what our heart will be inclined to is what will be our stronghold, our cover, our trust, our treasure, our goal, and our worship. And let us look at what does it mean to incline your heart to the Lord's testimonies. And so it's not enough just to incline your heart. We need to understand what that is. And so when you need to be cured of this covetousness, the cure is what we will look at right now. And there are five ways in which you can test and to... uh, use this or take this medicine and so the root of all evil is love for money and it is existent in all and here's the uh, medicinal recipe against it first to incline your heart to the lord's testimonies means acknowledge the authority of the preached word over yourself in the form of the person who is clothed into the authority of a father of god and his helpers who are in one spirit with him this is where the healing begins if today all of the helpers of pastor the leaders the episcopals the the deacons any other servants in the church would become free of uh of this covetousness and there would be full victory uh this begins with acknowledging the authority of the preached word that is the person who is clothed into the authority of a father of god this is the first step to being freed from covetousness but it's not this is not it second to incline your heart to the lord's testimonies means <clears throat> it's to pay the price for the right to the power to place these seeds of the word of truth into the good soil of your heart <clears throat> the second step And so I've received uh, the Lord's person and I've cleansed my heart from dead works. And to, uh, we need to have the right motives in our heart, in our righteous heart. When the person of God speaks, it sometimes hurts and or, or feels like it cuts. And so for us, we have the decision to either hide all of this or to open up our heart and work on our heart. <clears throat> and that means putting the word of truth into your heart. Third, to incline your heart to the Lord's testimonies means confess the truth of the word with your mouth placed into your heart as your possession. And so everything is confirmed by our mouth, the mouth, our confessions, acknowledging God's authority over ourselves, God's order, and then receiving the truth that is preached by this person, placed by God, 
it will not be confirmed, of course, if we will not confess it with our mouth. This truth that we've received, confessing with our mouth, <clears throat> is not the first step. <clears throat> and so we first need to clean our heart. The second is renewing our mind. And third is confessing with our mouth. When you when you don't have covetousness within your heart, you are be, we will be able to uh, proclaim the word, the truth that's in your heart. Fourth is to incline to incline your heart to the Lord's testimonies means dedicate the members of your body to voluntary servitude to the confessed truth and hallow this truth within your heart. And so in this fourth requirement, we need to act according to the truth that we have put into our heart and that we confess. We are not able to act until we confess. When you say, well, I know what to do, it's not enough just to know because you you or I will never be able to do it with anything just knowing it. We know the truth, but we need to confess this truth, confessing and confessing and speaking this truth, talking about it in cell groups or in our prayers or communicating with one another. We speak these truths and we then allow it to demonstrate itself in our life. And even in our fellowship with one another about truth or in cell groups, the old man in this way is being bound. Even just having this fellowship with one another, we are binding him because our lips ratify the truth that is within our heart. If it is just in the heart and in our mind, it means nothing. We need to confess so that we can bind the man, old man, and uh, allow, open up access to the blessings of God into our life. And now the fifth, to incline your heart to the Lord's testimonies means be vigilant and stand guard of your dedication to the revelation of truth by the weapon of continual and absolute sanctification, preventing any foreign inclusions from entering this truth. And so the devil understands that you have this truth, you've received this truth, but knowing that you need to confess and, and, and confirm this truth, he will make it that this he will attempt to destroy this truth if we will not keep our dedication by the form of sanctification and so you ded- dedicate yourself so you sanctify you separate yourself from something and so if you hear something being spoken uh, that is negative or contrary to what you know it could be even it could even be somebody from uh, that your church, your local church, but he will say something to kill that truth that's in you. So that we will not be able to, being sanctified, to preserve this truth within our heart. We're talking about the recipe required to be free of this covetousness. We need to incline our hearts to the Lord's testimonies and not to covetousness. And understandably, the given components without the preliminary cleansing of our conscience from dead works will not only be illegitimate, but will also be impossible. To diligently rule over yourself within the fear of the Lord, it is necessary for our thoughts and and our eyes to be turned to the righteousness of God consisted in His justice and not to covetousness. Jeremiah 22, 15 through 17. Shall you reign because you enclose yourself in cedar? Did not your father eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? Then it was well with him. He judged the cause of the poor and needy. Then it was well. Was not the knowing, was not this knowing me, says the Lord? Yet your eyes and your heart are for nothing but your covetousness, for shedding innocent blood and practicing oppression and violence. Jeremiah twenty two fifteen through 17. <clears throat> The prophets of the Lord became angry because the nation of God, instead of inclining their heart and their thoughts to the testimonies of the Lord, inclined their hearts and thoughts to covetousness and poured out the wrath fury of the Lord upon the carriers of this dishonest and shameful covetousness. Jeremiah 6, 10 through 15. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Indeed, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot give heed. Behold, the word of the Lord is a reproach to them. They have no delight in it. Therefore, I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary of holding it in. 
I will pour it out on the children outside, and on the assembly of young men together, for even the husband shall be taken with the wife, the aged with him who is full of days, and their houses shall be turned over to others, fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand against the inhabitants of the land, says the Lord, because from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness, and from the prophet even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They have also healed the hurt also healed the herd of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when you, there is no peace. Were they, were they ashamed when they have committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. Therefore they shall fall among those who fall at the time I punish them. They shall be cast down, says the Lord. It is specifically because of dishonest and vile covetousness that the overshadowing cherubim fell and has forever become the enemy of God, having condemned himself to eternal suffering in the lake of fire, burning with fire and brimstone. It is because of dishonest and vile covetousness that God did not accept Cain and his offering. This is because Cain did not seek the face of the Lord in his offerings, but instead materialistic blessings. It is because of covetousness that Balaam fell who heard and saw the revelations of the Lord, but replaced the revelations of the Lord for did not dishonest gain or covetousness. It is because of covetousness that Judas Iscariot fell and forever lost his virtue as an apostle, because it is specifically due to covetousness that he became a thief and betrayed his Lord to die a shameful death. Ezekiel 22, 12 through 16. In you they take bribes to shed blood. You take usury and increase. You have made profit from your neighbors by extor extortion and have forgotten me, says the Lord God. Behold, therefore, I beat my fists at the dishonest profit which you have made and at the bloodshed which has been in your midst. Can your heart endure or can your hands remain strong in the days when I shall deal with you? I, the Lord, have spoken and will do it. I will scatter you among the nations, disperse you throughout the countries. And these are powerful words. And these powerful words are addressed to the Church of God and to us. This was a very interesting price, fifth price of the condition to have the right to have the rock of the Lord in our spirit, and that is to integrate the order of God into our essence and to have these this order we need to have these characteristics uh, that the servant of God also has and we hearing the word of God have placed this truth into our heart we have agreed to be valiant to stand for the truth if the Lord died for our sins we will suffer for his truth and even if need die to be a honest person to have the codex of righteousness in your heart a, a person who refuses to have covetousness in his heart when it comes to each other within the service of uh, within our service in the church and covetousness so that it be completely absent uh, with from our heart in the next service on Friday we will be studying the sixth price for the right to have the rock of the Lord in our spirit and this is that the words of our mouth and the thoughts of our heart be acceptable before God here pastor will teach us how we need to cleanse our mouth and he allowed us on Friday uh, talking about this fifth condition to have the uh, the quality of, his, of the rock of the Lord uh, he'll be focused upon our lips our mouth and how they are able to bless us or curse us and it was interesting the Friday that he actually talked about this he brought forth everyone to the front for repentance that that service uh, and the words that we speak that bring uh, that curse and so we will be watching this video on Friday uh, so that we can learn about the importance of our, our mouth and our lips. And we will look uh, watch this video from the archives that we have.
And so right now, we will pray together and we call every person to this place that wants to break the shackles of sin, uh, the shackles of fear, ambitions, uh, and this covetousness in, the, in, in their heart, who wants to confirm righteousness, who wants to confirm justification. Thank God that we have in Jesus Christ this righteousness. And so right now we will pray together. Amen. I will be praying our prayer and I ask you to deeply believe that God is on your side he is not against you he has loved you with an eternal love he has given us the work of his redemption he has stood between us and our enemies to protect us to lift us up to his level <clears throat> close your eyes this is your secret room lift your hands to God this is a sign that hands are without wrath or doubt pray together with me Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I come to you and upon this holy place <clears throat> in the church of your people, I open up my heart so that you can see my pain, my suffering, my wound that is inflicted by sin and lust that I hate and that I reject. I come to you with my illnesses, with my fear, with a dishonor in my life, with a pampered dignity, I ask you, forgive me, wash me, cleanse me, heal my wounds, restore me, and protect me with the blood of your Son. And right now, before heaven and hell, I want to proclaim that in accordance to your words, I am washed, I am cleansed, I am healed, I am restored, I am justified and I am saved. Your sins are forgiven and your trespasses in the name of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you. May he look upon you with his great face and show you mercy and give you peace. May upon you, that if a thousands and ten thousands attempt to come near you, they will not touch you. May the blessings of the ancient mountains and everlasting hills be on you. May the old man be thrusted out of your body with noise, and may the stronghold of life be erected in its place. May all of this come upon you and upon all of the children. In the name of Jesus Christ, the nation shall say, Amen. And as you can see, I 
I went through the sermon. Uh, it was a very condensed sermon, and we will need you'll need to di uh, digest it and go through it in more detail, of course. Uh, so we so in cell groups, of course, uh, because it's very important. Let us finish with our manifestation. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever Amen